You are listening to Eastman's Flycast, an adventure fly fishing specific podcast covering travel, tactics, and next level insight. Now your host, Brian Barney. Hey, what's happening, guys? I got a brand new Eastman's Flycast for you. So this week I have back on my friend Todd Helms. So Todd Helms works as the editor over at Eastman's. He also does all the Wingman content and the Wingman podcast. So I ran over there about, uh, oh, it's it's been maybe a couple weeks. Uh, fished a day before I got to the office, which it fished so good. A uh, little white streamer. They were just killing for wintertime. So had a blast doing that and then met up with Todd at the office and we sat down and, and uh, recorded this fly cast. Um, so I... I pretty much enjoy every con- every conversation I have with Todd, and he's so passionate about fly fishing and so knowledgeable. Uh, spent time in Alaska, which you'll you'll be able to hear one of his his good stories about Alaska, and then um, spent time guiding before he was a teacher, before he worked at a, as the editor at Eastman's, and uh, just has some great stories and great insight. He's a great fly fisherman. Uh, I love fishing with them, and I also love uh, talking story with them. So I really enjoyed today's podcast. I think you guys will too. I want to thank our sponsor for today's show, Avid Max. So Avid Max has absolutely everything fly fishing and a knowledgeable staff. Um, so they've got a great internet site where you can order anything you need. Uh, they also, if you're in the Denver area, you can stop by. They have a, a storefront there that you can stop by and visit and um, get everything you need from that. Uh, They also do a good job with content. Uh, They do like a Fly Tying Tuesday where they tie new patterns on there. Um, They've got a blog, uh, and they've got a whole whole staff they call Avid Anglers that are a really knowledgeable staff that produce content for the blog and different things of that nature. Um, So absolutely everything fly fishing, whether that's uh, Euro nymphing, streamer fishing, rods, reels, flies, fly boxes... Um, everything for fly tying, uh, they have watercrafts, photo and travel, dog gear, a great clearance section, like, like literally anything you need for fly fishing. In fact, I just replaced my reel on my streamer rod. I had gone cheap on my reel on my streamer rod and I was paying for it. The line was getting snagged in between, um, oh, kind of in between the spool and the reel itself. It would get snagged in there and then... Gosh, I had this problem where the drag worked great. I'd have it all set, but somehow if you if you reeled a little forward or the the spool went a little forward, then it would just free spin backwards and just make a nest. It was so frustrating. So I finally had to spend the money and get a better reel, so I upgraded that. So I won't be uh, fighting my streamer rod so bad this season. Uh, but Avid Max, great company. If you need anything, make sure to check them out, and I sure appreciate their support on the podcast. Uh, Yeah, over there at Eastman's, fun getting together with those guys. Uh, I've got some recordings planned. Uh, Like Guy Eastman just absolutely loves to throw streamers. I heard he got it right after I left. He sent me some photos. and uh, I want to get Ike on there. Um, Ike just got back from a bone fishing trip in the Bahamas. Um, So cool. I I, I love traveling there whenever I can to chase bones or tarpons. Um, and and I may have a tarpon trip in the works, which I'm super excited about. We'll see if it comes to fruition for this summer. And, um, yeah, just excited to keep after him wintertime fishing here. Got to make a steelhead trip. Uh, just trying to, to work it out with all my, um, with all my work obligations and podcast obligations and be able to sneak out of here for a week and go do a little fishing. So super excited for that as well. But it's been really fun. Like I'm so fortunate to live out west and be able to chase these trophy fish around. And, and wintertime has been great. It's like every day above freezing, I've been chasing them, you know, local rivers, different rivers. Um, I say I got it really good when I went over to the Eastman's office over there. They were chasing white and saw, you know, I don't know why it is I always lose the biggest fish I hook of the day, but definitely caught some nice ones chasing that white. Um, super fun. And then it's it's turning on around here as well. Uh, got it when I got back. Uh, got out a couple drifts with my dad. And, uh, yeah, it was just insanely good fishing. And rainbows are starting to stack up and stage, getting ready for the spawn. Didn't see any active spawners or anything, but uh, they're in these big runs that, you know, blow gravel beds and things of that nature. Uh, and starting to stack in there, and they're um, they're feisty and really hungry. And so uh, fun to get my dad out, a couple wintertime drifts, and um, 
you know, just have plans to keep chasing around and spend as many days on the water as I can. So it's been really fun. It's been really fun uh, sharing it with you guys as well. So uh, thanks for the support of Eastman's Flycast. Uh, I've been talking long enough. This is a long podcast already, but it's a great one. Uh, so my buddy Todd Helms from over at the Eastman's office. Uh, I'm your host, Brian Barney, Eastman's Flycast. Here we go. All right, I got Todd Helms on here at the Eastman's office. So uh, uh, one of my favorite podcasts is to get together with Todd and just start talking fly fishing. So we've already done about 15 minutes off, mic. I figure we better press <laughs> record. Yeah, that's a good idea. Thanks for <laughs> thanks for having me, man. I appreciate oh, it. My pleasure. Congratulations on the Wingman podcast. That's doing really oh, well. Oh, cool. Thanks. Yeah, we're having a good time with it. We're having a great time with it. It's it's been fun. You know, we had kind of a kind of a slow last month just because it's the peak of well was the peak of waterfowl season, and so guys are chasing birds and they're not you know they're out hunting. They're not you can't get a hold of them, and that's okay. But. Um, yeah, we've had some great guests on. God, you just have A list celebrities. Like, it's crazy. Uh, you've had the the biggest guys in bird hunting on the podcast. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah if, it, if if a big all the big names in waterfowl, I've had. I need to do better getting some of the young blood in there, because that's one thing about waterfowl is there's definitely like there's the guys our age that were he- my heroes growing. You know, not growing up, but when we were, and we're all the same age. You know, like the Sean Stalls and the Kelly Powers and the the Hudnall bro, the Hudnall boys. I mean, I've had them all on a podcast, and those guys were like, they're still a big deal. Don't get me wrong, but there's a next generation that's coming up underneath them mm-hmm. and working with them and working for them. That like the world champion goose callers and those guys. Those are the guys that I got to find. It's like the next generation of things coming up. And right. it happens in, in hunting and in bird hunting and fly fishing, you know. And, and those guys get to learn from uh, the more experienced guys that figured it out that were pioneers when they started doing it. Right. But they get to learn from that and then evolve it and get better yet, you know. So I'm with you. And I also think... You know, not only getting different age classes and, and different skill. I think it's also important on the podcast to get all different skill levels from beginner to expert and everywhere in between, just so you cover all those different perspectives as well. I, I agree. I agree. We were just talking about the the fly fishing side of things and fly fishers can be stubborn mm-hmm. because they don't want necessarily want to admit that they don't know how to do something. But they're the smart ones have always got their eyes open and head on a swivel, absorbing what everybody around them is doing. That's you know? uh, exactly right. Our male ego gets in our way more times than yep. not, you yep. know. And 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 I, you know, I try not to have an ego, and I try to learn from everybody. And and really, to be a student of the game is the smartest person out there. To really right. listen to people right. and, and and gain knowledge. And so, you know, this podcast has been great for me for that. Like talking to some really good fly fishermen. But the the best example I have is um, I was fishing with uh, my buddy Dylan. And we were fishing the salmon fly hatch last year. Now, you got it really good with your dad, and I'm yep. sure we'll get into that. Yep. But I was fishing it with Dylan, and um, we were going down. And, and you know how it's real sporadic, and you're really trying to time the hatch to get into the heart of the hatch. Right. And sometimes it's tough. I have no problem committing to a dry fly for the day, for the week, for the month during salmon flies. And um, so, like, I can commit to it, but – if you're not catching fish, it's really easy to <laughs> tie on a streamer or yep. to try tie on a caddis or to tie on tie on something that's going to work. And then, oh, once we get into the bugs, we'll switch back off. So this was the case this day, right? And we're fishing salmon flies. I had us a little too low on the hatch the day before. We caught some. We went back up top. And, and uh, you almost told me the exact same story of going in front of the hatch. There's no bugs where we start, so it's slow fishing. But once we get into the bugs, it's going to be red hot. So we go down. They're not really eating dries. And so Dylan's a really good streamer fisherman. He starts fishing some streamers and picking up some fish here and there. And and all of a sudden, we're starting to see all these bugs hatch. And I've got Dylan in the front. And um, Dylan hasn't fished the salmon fly hatch a bunch. He's a super fishy dude. But therefore, he doesn't have his patterns that he's really dialed or has confidence on. So he's fishing a couple different patterns. And, and we're fighting it. We can't really seem to bring fish up. We can't seem to catch fish. And the bugs are on the water. Like the whole magic of the salmon fly yep. hatch is happening right be, you know, right in front of our eyes. 
and, and I think I saw one actually take a, a natural, and I pulled over. I said, we, we got to figure it out. Like, it's it's going off, and we're not catching them. And there was this boat that went by, and the, the guy yells out from the boat. Uh, he goes, uh, he says something like, oh, I bet you guys are killing them. Or, you know, he saw two dry flies on there. He goes, God, it's the best day of dry fly fishing. You guys are killing them, right? And, and I go, yeah, you know, your first instinct is just to say yeah and let your ego take you over, liar. you know? Yeah, <laughs> and I'm lying through my teeth. So pretty soon I catch myself in my own lie, and I turn and I go, no, no, actually, I said, I can't get them to eat. I said, there's bugs all around, and they're eating, I can't get them to eat. And, and he looks over, and he goes, water walker, bro, like that. And, he, like, he goes down the river and lands another one, and we switch to that water walker, and it was just something about that fly that day. Usually they'll eat any salmon yeah. fly during that, but yeah. for some reason they really wanted that one or wanted it skating and we started getting into it but it was it was all because i let that ego down you know and said no actually we're not you know and he goes oh we're catching them there and it, it's so tough to let something like that go but um man I, it's um so important to be a student of the game and always trying to learn and and um and pay attention and then talk to people as well as you're fishing and you know a lot of people are pretty secretive of what's going on but there's a lot of good guys that'll share with you at a boat launch of what they caught them on or what they're eating on or what they're seeing out there and i think that's the best way to be i do too i do too and and i think that i think that ego thing gets in the way for us <clears throat> like you said that that male ego whether we want to admit it or not it definitely gets in the way the inverse of that is the female lack of ego that i see in my boat all summer long as a guide they jump in and if they don't know anything they flat tell you i don't know anything They'll admit teach, it. They're not me. like a guy, right? No. <laughs> a I guy would pretend. He'd tell you he's the best fisherman no, they do. in the world. <laughs> they do. That's exactly what they do. They literally – I had a couple this summer. Um, mom and dad were in one boat, and uh, daughter and boyfriend were in my boat. And boyfriend doesn't have a clue. Doesn't have a clue. Girlfriend – I've we've both fished some, you know, and she's already making – not excuses, but being honest. Mm-hmm. And we caught fish. We had a great time. They were awesome clients. They were they were great. She listened to every single word that came out of my mouth and applied them, or at least tried to apply them. He, now, wouldn't even, so this is the funny part. She's in the front of the boat for the first half of the day. I'm like, hey, how about we switch? And so I can help. No, it's good. I'm good. I'm good. And he was riding the struggle bus out of the back seat, man. I mean, it was, it was pretty, pretty funny, but we ended up catching a bunch of fish and having a good time. But even that right there, whether he was trying to be put on a show for her or for me or for mom and dad, who knows, but that ego, man, it, it, it bites us. It the gets male in ego the way. gets in our way. And it, like you say, it even gets in our own way when we try not to let it, but yeah, you really have to let it all go. I, I remember I fished with this guy. Um, I, w- I was uh, 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 building a prop, building a house for him, and so he said, "Oh, let's go out fishing. It's really good out on salmon flies." And and this is the guy that, you know, he tells you all the stories in the world of fishing everywhere across everywhere. He's just done it all. He knows it. He's been fishing this river forever. So, you know, he just gets done just telling me all this stuff, and it's like. Um, well, yeah, that's that's fine, but you know, here we are on the Madison, the river that I fish all the time, and I fish this hatch all the time. You think that guy would listen to one thing I had to say? He kept fishing the rod like way down in front of the bow of the boat, you know, which can be effective. It was just for the style of fishing that we were doing. He wasn't getting the drift, wasn't getting the hook set, and just couldn't catch fish. And then, and then started to get frustrated, you know. And I just, you just got to put that cast and that drift off the oar blade over there. You're going right. to have a better shot at him, right. you know. But, but he how just... much of that with his stories about fishing all over the world was to impress you? That's what it was. Yeah, I and bet you see it guiding all the time. All the time. Uh, yeah, all the time. The thing is, is you know when somebody can fish. 
it isn't the stories they tell you or how they can tell you the fish. You see it with the skill of the rod in their yep. hands. When they get yep. a stick in their hands, you can instantly tell how long they fish. And everybody has different preferences. Oh, and yeah. Different oh, yeah. Uh, techniques, We're not talking tactics. Style. No. no, there's totally different styles to it. But you can always tell how much experience a guy has when he gets a yep. stick in his hands. Well, and now go, go back to that, to that young, young gal and her boyfriend. I could tell out of the two of them, she was the more – she was the more athletic of the two. You could tell by the way she stood in the front of the boat. You could tell by the way she moved in the front of the boat. You could tell by the way she tried to cast and tried to do things. It was like, this isn't going to be hard for her to figure out. And, yeah, she she kicked butt all day long. It was funny because she and her dad had a contest going. And I think mom was kind of along for the ride. And it was fine. We, she had a good time. She ended up getting pretty tipsy by the end of the day. But <laughs> we, we had a great – it was it was one of the best, best trips fun. of the year. We yeah, had that's ball, really cool. You know, yep. they're really fun people to, to, to be with. But dad and daughter, man, had it. they had quite the competition going. How many you got? How big? You know, we had to keep a, a like a running ledger of the size of the fish. Mm-hmm. It was pretty – it was a lot of fun. But you're absolutely right. You can just tell. And it's usually the people that are talking the most are the ones that have the least amount of skill. Yeah. You know, it's the ones that – and it's different if you if they're telling, like, a, fish, a fishing story For or sure. this, that, or the other thing. Yeah. It's, they start talking about their own exploits. Braggadocious. It's, yeah. Yeah. It's, you go, hmm, well, we'll see. Mm-hmm. And sometimes they live up to it. Sometimes. Yep. But I think, yeah, in my experience in the rowing people down rivers, it's, yeah – most of the time, if they're doing a lot of this, flapping their gums, they they can't fish their way out of a wet paper bag. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's so true. Well, and just being coachable and being able to listen and take information in, and you know, I I try to learn from everybody. And I I also, if I'm fishing in somebody's boat, I want to fish their style. So I I want him to tell me how he wants to see that fly, how he wants to see the men's, how far from the bank, in front of the rock, behind the rock, because he's got more insight on that river than I do. And also he's rowing me down. I want him to see that fly the way he wants to see it. Um, So I really try to take that in. But, um, you know, and it's tough to take criticism or take direction oh, it's tough you know it's tough for us guys to do that yep. um but but i always try to listen to to whatever he's saying and try to take in the information and that's part of like those those clients that you were guiding is she was coachable she didn't have an ego she had nothing to prove to you she was out for a good time and anything you said she took in and i definitely see that with my dot girls just they learn really good <laughs> they like my daughters they listen to what i have to say and they take it to heart and apply it whether that's shooting or casting a fly rod right. like they just really learn well it's like a, a lot of times us guys we're just in our own way a lot of times i, I think. think so yeah i think <laughs> so i it was funny talking about women learning things my when my wife and i got married she wanted to hunt hadn't hunted didn't come from a hunting family didn't fished but didn't fly fish and i she wanted to learn how to fly fish and we went up on a little mountain stream by where we live it's full of cutthroats and some nice fish in there what a great place to learn too Uh, small stream yep small stream and these fish they're cutties so they're pretty naive you know they're you could pretty much stand over them and catch them and she'd never really picked up a rod before i kind of showed her a little bit at the truck we walked down in there i we come up on this little pool and there's three or four nice cutties just sipping. I don't know. I think it was PMDs or caddis. I don't remember what it was, but I was like, all right, so you got to lay your cast about two feet in front of that one upstream. Remember that current's going to drift down. And she'd been with me and watched me do it enough where she had an idea of what it looked supposed to look like. And I'll be darn Brian. If she didn't put two casts in there, like perfect cast, never really cast the flower before but had, had been paying attention, watching, and then paying attention to what I said and was able to put it all together physically, put a fly in there, like second cast, caught, a, caught like a 17-inch cutty on a dry fly. Mm-hmm. And she was hooked. And now to this day, she'll go months and months and months without touching a fly rod and can still stand in the front of the boat and deliver 60-footers to the bank, you know, like nobody's business. And I'm going, the natural ability there because, you know, she listened, 
She there was learned. no ego. There were no preconceived notions. She listened to everything I that I had to say, and plus with the physical ability that she has, she's she's awesome. And she didn't learn any bad habits. No, she didn't have to learn things no. like we did, where you make mistakes constantly and then have to relearn it or no reteach kidding. yourself. You know, she learned everything from the right way from the ground up, and she listened, so she didn't have any bad habits, and she had the the right way to throw that thing. Yep. Well, yeah. you ought to see my five year old. I bought her her own little rod last summer. I was like, I don't know if this is going to take. I'm not going to spend a lot of money. I think I bought her like a $35 yellow eagle claw. Mm -hmm. Bought a cheap reel, cheap line, put it all together. I'd string it all up, show her how it all goes together. We're standing in the backyard. And she's all of a sudden, she's perfect form, perfect rod stop, back, front and back. Lines laying out front and back. She's, I'm like, okay, that's really good. You got all the rhythm down. So now I want you to try to start popping the heads off those dandelions with that flat, with that piece of fuzz. Okay, Daddy. And she's getting it within inches of those dandelion heads. I'm, and my buddy Sam, who we had on the pie, po pa, podcast last summer, he was there. And we took her fishing. And he looked at me. He's like, dude, she fishes better than some of my friends. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, and she just picked it up and did it. Well, mm -hmm. Again, watching me all the time mm -hmm. and then listening. And I really – he had Sam asked me, he's like, how much coaching have you done with her? I said, none. None. I just stuck a fly rod in her hand. And I said, that's all from listening to me talk about it and watching me do it. Mm -hmm. But I said, I don't want to coach her at this point. I just want her to love it. Yeah. Fall in love with it. And if I'm talking and yapping about how to do it, she's that's not going to be yeah. fun. Or stop, you're doing this wrong. Right. Stop, right. do just this. Like, do Just let her do it. Yeah, yeah, let her start casting. You know, you mentioned something there, Todd, that I think is really important. And it's how your wife learned and also how your daughter learned. I think we learn so much from watching and we do so little of it. Yep. Like, um, I, I really learn, like, you know, you talk about people's skill with a fly rod, but everybody has – Everybody, like you mentioned, everybody has their own style. Everybody has their style. They like to throw men's, throw the fly, land the fly. Like there's all these different styles to it. But you get a really good fisherman in the front of your boat. I'll learn more watching him fish from the front of my boat than I will anything he can tell me, anything he can tell me about my casting, any, just by watching. And I, I, I fish with my buddy – uh, uh, Polson a lot, and my buddy Eric Polson is his name, but he's um he's such a great fisherman. We met him at the boat launch when we were you and I were fishing a couple of years ago. Okay, we? pretty sure we did. Yeah, so uh, he's a great fisherman, but um you know watching him fish or watching you fish or watching these guys that I've had in the front of my boat, I learned so much. But I think it's interesting that guides take these clients, and clients never watch the guides cast. They never – so the guide's trying to instruct them all day long on how to do it. No, it needs to be like this or back this way or back that way. Like I think just watching that guide in the front of your boat for five minutes or even just handing the guide a rod and say, hey, show me how you do that thing there. How would you fish this? And all of a sudden you've been trying to do this thing he's been telling you all day, but all of a sudden he launches a cast with ease and throws the men's and it goes down. And it's like you can visualize it. Like, oh, I can see it. And maybe I'm just a visual learner, but I learned so much just watching really good fishermen fish. I think you're spot on, Brian. Um one of the things that I do, if I if I know my clients are rank beginners, right? They don't, whether they tell me that or whether they, I can tell that immediately. One of the first things I do is I find a spot where we can all get out of the boat. Right off the bat, like I'll get out of the way because usually in the mornings boat launches are busy, you know, and you float down a little ways and there's just usually a spot where you can anchor up and everybody gets out and you've got lots of back cast room and I'm like, okay. We're all rigged up. We're ready to go. But before we do this, I want you guys to watch what I'm what I mean. When I say upstream mend, this is what I mean. When I say downstream mend, this is what I mean. When I want you to watch how I cast these this rig. And usually within oh, it doesn't take long, a few minutes of that, I hand them their rods and they're doing it. And they usually can can mimic that fairly well. So I think you're absolutely on to something there. I'd never thought of it that way. That's just something that I've always done. Um, it's like, okay, 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 hold up. Give me the rod. Just watch. Just watch. I've done that a lot. And I see, I do see quite a few guides do that, but they usually do it 
right at the beginning of the day. Um, and it's almost always with people they know are inexperienced, whether it's kids, you know, a lot, a lot with kids. I watched, I watched a guide this summer on your river on the Madison, um, put the boat in, row out to the tail end of this Island where he was out of the way and start walking this young lady by young. I mean, eight, 10 years old through what he wanted her to do how he wanted her to fish the salmon fly. And sure enough, a couple hours later, I'm we're end up, you know, you're doing that boat chain thing down the river, you know, everybody's there's lots of boats. He's right in front of me and I watched him put two fish that she caught in the in the net. And I'm going, that that's cool. How he cool. spent 5 minutes teaching at the beginning of the day and it paid dividends. I mean, who knows how many fish that kid caught. But I guarantee you she got the most out of her day. Because he took the time to show her, mm-hmm. it's I, like it's like there we when I was when I was teaching school we had a saying and it was I remember a quarter of what you tell me I remember half of what you show me and I remember all of what we do together. And so it's those incremental steps. You tell somebody, then you show them, and then you walk through it together, and then you turn them loose, and they learn from experience after that. And it's spot on. I mean, that's very, very true. So that's interesting. I didn't, I didn't even really realize I was doing that until you said something. That's so smart, Todd. Well, and I love, you know, not only learning by watching, but, but also you clear up all the communication right at the beginning of the day. Right, so they don't have to guess what an upstream mend is as you're going down. They don't have right. to guess what a shelf is or what a you know a, a seam is or what a you know. All of a sudden, you can describe all these things with uh, with with visual you know uh, like like being able to see it exactly how it should look and go okay when i tell you to mend upstream this is what it looks like downstream men looks like this you know the seam this is what a seam is you know this is a um so so just being able to clear up the communication i I think is a lot of it i know you know not of recently or of lately but i know there's been times when i've been in the front of the boat and somebody the whoever's oaring is is telling me something or describing something that i don't know what it is for half the drift you right. know whether it's lingo or right. whether it whatever and it, everybody's lingo is different yeah you know it's half the half of the battle sometimes when you are fishing with somebody new is figuring out what the hell they mean <laughs> by what they're saying you know yes. it's, it's like Oh, throw that! No, inside, inside, yeah. Yeah. inside. I do that. I'm guilty of that. People are like inside. What are you talking about? Inside the seam. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Inside, outside. Yeah. You know. Yeah. You and I have fished together. Yeah. So we know that, and we have sim- similar lingo. But there's other people like what are I, I don't understand. Yeah. And they could they could go through half or a whole day of that before they even look at you and tell you they don't if understand. If they don't ask, that ego gets in the way. And if they don't ask. You know, I think back to when I was learning how to fish for steelhead in the Great Lakes. And I didn't know I didn't know anything. I was I was young. I was in high school, junior high. Man, you could there was there's was always that one dude that was slay them. Whether it was on bait and spinning rigs or fly, or on a fly rod. It didn't matter. And I was, I've always been such a student of things that I knew how to set stuff up. I knew how to do this. I knew what water to look for, yada, yada, yada. But there was obviously little intricacies that I was missing because they'd catch twice as many fish as I would. And it drove me nuts. You know, that competitiveness, I was like, mm, I have to, not that I wanted to beat them. I wanted to catch fish like that. Mm-hmm. And I remember watching this one guy i won't say his name but i remember watching him and we were down and below in this tailwater and pool this the spillway pool was full of, of fresh run steelhead i mean you know what it looks like when they're fresh run they're porpoising they're splashing around these fish were they were grabby i mean they'd hit anything you threw in there except for what i was using and everybody else but this guy 
We'd been there all night, Brian. We got there at dark, fished all night long, caught maybe two, three, and he walks down right at lay light in the morning and catches like eight fish and eight casts. He's like, yep, see you boys, walks by and, and takes off. And I'm like, so the next time I'm paying attention, and he was doing this funniest little thing. It was, we were fishing floats with jigs under them. And he, I was just always dead drifting my float with my jig, right? He's wiggling his rod like he's shaking a rod. Like how you pick up a fly rod and you wiggle it, test it. Mm-hmm. That's what he was doing. About every two or three feet, he'd wiggle his rod. Well, that would send, and you'd look out at his float, and his float would be wiggling. Well, what's his jig doing underneath that float? It's bouncing up and down, right? And I went, hmm. So the next time I went down, like the next day, I mean, I'm fishing the exact same rig he is, even the same color and style jig. I went down, and I started wiggling my rod like that. Bam. I caught like 10 fish that morning. And it was like the light bulb came on. And I got, and it was because I was paying attention. I was mm-hmm. watching him. And from that day forward, and there's been other times I remember I really want to learn how to spay, how to spay cast. Mm-hmm. And I'm reading stuff, and I'm YouTube didn't exist. Are you kidding me? You had to get a VHS or a DVD video. Deck Hogan had a series of DVDs out at the time, and I remember I wanted them, but I couldn't afford them. I was, you know, <laughs> one of those deals. Mm-hmm. And I remember watching this dude fish some other guy i remember watching him one evening in march come down to the river and he's got this 15 foot i don't know what brand it was sage loomis whatever and he starts ripping off these 100 foot snap tea spay casts and he's doing all kinds of cool crap and it looked so elegant it was so sexy you know i was just like wow and I just I sat on the bank. I quit fishing and I sat on the bank and I watched him fish. I watched how he moved his rod, you know. And I fly fished enough where at that point I was still young. I think I was 17, 18 years old. But I understood hydraulics. I understood loading and and deloading a rod. I understood all that stuff. And I'm watching him do it. And I'm like, I can do that. I can do that. And I saved my money that whole summer. And at the end of the summer, going into salmon season. I was able to buy a St. Croix Imperial 14-foot, 9, 10-weight spay rod. And got a reel for it, got a line for it. And, man, I practiced and practiced and practiced and practiced. And lo and behold, I, by learning and watching, I was able to teach myself how to do a couple of rudimentary spay casts. Not, I am not an expert spay caster, but I can do a few things. Mm-hmm. And I did that by watching, by paying attention, and really analyzing what those guys were doing and having a desire to be better, have that drive. You have that drive. And that's one of the things that when we fish together, I love fishing with you because there's, and I've told you this, there's an intensity, there's a fire, but there's a fun-loving side to mm-hmm. it as, as well. And I love that because that's the way I am. That's like, the best, isn't it? Oh, I am what, there what? to catch fish yeah you're immersed in the challenge you know yeah. it's uh yeah you know, we we both run about the same but yeah it's so interesting that spay is even more so there's even more style to it mm. so even spending years with those spay rods and casting different setups whether that's nymphs or whether i'm swinging flies i still pick up tips just yep. watching people spay cast like if i can just watch them they might be loading or anchoring different or you know they have a different way that they set up their cast to get everything rolling so i'm continually learning on that spay um but but it is um you use a trout spay quite a bit don't you yeah yeah yeah, i do i I like that swing um and and i like the i like fishing bigger rivers with it like the madison i can cover holes that people can't streamer fish effectively where i can stop on the bank and swing the whole run so i really like it i've been fishing it a bunch this winter and um but yeah, talking. I just wanted to go back to what you were saying about um, that guy that was catching that fish, wiggling those jigs on the top. Mm-hmm. But isn't it funny how you can have the same setup as somebody else, same leader length, same bugs, same rod, same sitting in the front, same run, and one guy catches more fish. Now, 
I fish with a bunch of fishy buddies. So we usually go, you know, hard, you know, maybe one guy will get the better of it one day and then the other guy will get the better of it at the other day, you know, but boy, I've seen cases and times like I can remember, um, steelhead fishing, you know, and a lot of times like, um, nymph fishing is kind of the lowest or fishing with an indicator is the, the lowest down the rung of the ladders of skill level needed to catch a fish in the Madison. You know, if you got some guide clients and you stick on an indicator and some nymphs, a lot of times, you know, the fish will almost hook themselves as it drags downstream. And, um, you know, so it's seen as an easier style of fish, but there's so many nuances yes, to it. I was just going to say know, that, that, that that two people are not created equal with the same setup and the same tie. And I, I went steelhead fishing with a couple buddies that are a really good fishermen. And, and if I'm being truthful, they probably outfish me for trout. They're, you know, one guy guides over a hundred year, hundred days a year. And the other guy's just a super fishy dude. They're great trout fishermen. Had never been steelhead fishing, but they hadn't, um, put in that time behind the nymph rod because they, uh, trout fishing, they're either fishing dries or they're fishing right. streamers. Right. So they didn't have that nuance to the to the nymph rod and this was all we were fishing a giant stream that runs 20,000 cfs i mean the thing's a monster and we're fishing 15 foot spay rods and we're fishing holes that are anywhere from 10 to 15 foot deep yep. but with steelhead in them and it's funny how those nuances i had been fishing steelhead and nymphing for them for so long that i could hand them my rod and it's still i i'd catch 10 to 1 almost, so those steelhead, just with those nuances of that drift, you know, and, and even I'd, I'd spend a quarter of a time in the front of the boat as they would, but it was just still tough to get those nuances that are picked up over time, and it's the same thing with any any style of fly fishing, whatever that is, whether it's streamers, dry flies, nymphs, or whatever, but my point is, is that there's there's just these nuances to the way and style that you fish things that sometimes sometimes it's just believing in it or it's just confidence. It's like weird in fly fishing that you could have the same rod, same setup, and hand it to four different guys that are going to have four different results on the river. No, you're absolutely right. And every single one of those guys, no matter how fishy they are, they're going to fish that setup. Every single one of them is going to fish it different. Mm -hmm. And – out of those four guys on any given day, two of them are going to have the hot hand, mm -hmm. and they probably fish it completely differently. Mm -hmm. My buddy Sam and I fish, and Sam's been on the podcast with us, but he's great, by the way. I oh, really like Sam. Should, we need to fish with. We him. have to this year when he's, he comes up. He's awesome. He seems like he'd be way fun. So, getting back to that, and okay, so I'm going to I'm going to go off of what you said into. You're, my grandpa always used to say, you're not holding your mouth right. You know, basically, your attitude sucks, you know. I had a day this summer in the boat with Sam. Started out phenomenal. Waded into this run. Had this giant rainbow move, man, I don't know how far off the bank. Basically, I'm staying in waist-deep water, and the river I was fishing is really, can be really grassy. And those fish lay in that grass, and when stuff comes floating by – they ambush it out of the grass. And so and a lot of times, they don't see it right away. So you'll have to make repeated casts to the same spot before they see it. And I was fishing a, a, a hopper dropper rig, and this fish comes down. I see it swimming down the river. I'm waist-deep water. It's August, warm. And I see this giant rainbow just come cruising down. But he's kind of on a mission, you know? And he's coming right to me. And I'm watching, and it dawns on me, he's coming after my flies. Brian, they're 30 feet. I don't know how far he was because I saw him. He was 30 feet at least from my flies when I first saw him, and he's coming right to him. Not lazy, but not smoking either. He drifts down, and I'm watching, 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 and he, I see him turn, flare his gills, and go away. And about that time, my hopper goes down and follows him. And I'm like, he ate my dropper. I lifted the rod, bang, had him on, big fish. I mean, we're talking two-foot fish, eight pounds. I mean, this thing is a tank. Kicks my butt, breaks me off. I'm like, okay, broke me off. What Crap. was your task, by the way? I was fishing 1X to my dropper. <laughs> it's a 12-pound task. Yeah. Or 10-pound, whatever. Yeah, it's is. like, as I was fishing, I always fish on that river. I fish 0X to my hoppers, and I fish 1X to my dropper, and – he broke me off like nothing. <laughs> That's a good fish. You know, and I was like, okay. 
I'm going to walk it back to the boat. From that fish forward, I hooked probably 30 more fish before I landed one. Wow. I'd have them on and be fighting them. I'd get them right to the boat. Fly pop out. It was just like we were la- – I had to just like laugh by, by 15 deep, and I haven't landed one. And Sam's put God knows how many fish in the boat because we'd take turns. Three fish – you're rowing three fish you're rowing you know you get that rotation he landed everything he caught i could not boat a fish i could hook them i couldn't boat them isn't that comical it is and i'm watching it and i'm going what am i doing differently than any other day but i think it was be i i I thought about this day a hundred times and it got to it got so bad we got to this one hole right in the evening at dark and I was pulling streamers through it. It's real fast and deep. And I was pulling a streamer through the head of this run. And I think I hooked six or eight fish and landed one. One. And I'm, I'm not talking they're like picking at it. I'm talking they crush it. And they're big head shakes, you know, and come off. I'm just going, what is so frustrating? I, got, I was so angry at one point. And I finally, I just like, I can't be angry. This is ridiculous. I'm ruining a day of good fishing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I thought back on that day. We went out the very next day on a different river, and I smoked them. I was like 100%. Never lost a fish. What is the difference? I think what it was for me is that day, I knew, because I, I guide that river a lot, and I knew what the fishing was going to be like. I knew it was going to be fire. And I was so amped up that I was I was leaning on those fish too hard. And I was popping hooks out of them. I know that's what I was doing. In hindsight, I was just so amped up. And Sam was just chill. He was just chill. We were fishing the same patterns, the same way, same style. Everything was the same. Except I was being too hard on those fish. And I was pu- pulling flies out right out of their mouth. And he was letting the rod do the work you know just enjoying the ride and here i am out there freaking getting mma with them on the river you know and popping fish off and so knowing that looking having the and i wish sam would have said something but i don't think he realized what was going on but <clears throat> knowing that i got thinking about it and like i said the next day was a lot different and i was more mellow the next day i wasn't as keyed up we were fishing a different river. I didn't quite know what to expect, you know, so it was like more go with the flow. No, man, it was it was bad. It was bad. It was the worst, the worst best day of fishing I had all year, you know. But it's so crazy how you can like I just like we said, one guy can be slaying and the other guy can be struggling. Mm-hmm. And after that was that day. Mm-hmm. That was that day, and it wasn't. It wasn't the problem. Was hooking fish. That wasn't a big deal. It was putting them in the net. Well, and the the more frustrated you get, or the, the more you start to the overthink it, it. Yeah, the worse it gets. Yeah. I launched. I launched an Orvis Helios thirty feet that day. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I lost. A, uh, I lost a brown that would go easily twenty four, probably bigger. You know, and he's pushing that double digit pound mark because these the fish in this river are tanks. And he he crushed a streamer off the bank, and I had him right to the net, and he's done. You know those browns will fight like crazy right away, and then it's like they give up, and he's done. I'm sliding to the net, hook pops out, and I didn't even hesitate. I just pivoted on my left foot and freaking <laughs> launched that rod. I was like, Rah! you know, and part of it was I knew where I was. I knew I'd be able to get the rod yeah, back. Yeah. You know, it was shallow riffle. It wasn't going anywhere, but I was. I was so angry. Oh, my gosh. Uh, I like your honesty. Like, uh, it, admitting when we're not at our best is sometimes difficult, but I've definitely been there before. It's sometimes you just get frustrated, you know, especially when you're not catching them. And for some reason, fishing has that knack. I don't know. I've got a knack for, you know, you build this skill of fighting big fish, and you know all the the leverage and the steps to take and where to keep your rod and tight line, when to give them line, when not. So you learn all this, and you get really good at playing fish, but then your test is when you hook one. And for some reason, it's just like the way it is. That hook will just slip out. It drives me nuts, you know. Was, uh, streamer fishing was off the hook yesterday. I, I don't know how many I landed after 11, 12 o'clock fishing with my buddy, but, of course, the best fish I hook that, that holds right 
right down to the bottom that's a great big brown that I'm right over top that it's like now it feels like I'm linked to the bottom but I'm not I got a giant brown trout and he just starts head shaking down there and it's like man and when a when a trout starts head shaking you can feel his size mm-hmm. especially when you when you caught a lot of steelhead or bigger size right. fish you can feel that fish that head shakes that takes more time to go back and forth where it's like oh my god he's got weight i can feel it yeah, and yeah. i had that fish on yesterday oh. and then you know just came unbuttoned you know I, I lost a couple of my nicest fish yesterday even though i landed a bunch and it was a great right, day right but it's like the one i i would have given all the 15 <laughs> back that i caught yeah, yeah. to see that, that one, one in the fish. net you know and that's the one that i lose but it's just the way it is. It's just fishing. And I try not to – it's kind of like stalking a big buck. I try not to get frustrated if it doesn't work out. I'm just happy to play the game. But I can't help it when I lose a big fish. That moment he comes unbuttoned, it's just like, oh, oh I'm going to try not to let it bother me. I'm going to try not to let it bother me. But It, it always it's, does, though. Oh, well, it's, they're just so few and far between. And when you get your chance, you want to be clutch and you want to yeah, get them absolutely. to the net. But it's just not a perfect – No. Perfect deal. No. And streamer fishing – you lose a lot of fish you for do. some reason. You I don't do. know. I don't fish barbs as part of my problem. Yeah, that's part of it. I, I, I see that as a guide because we pinch barbs on everything. Yeah, I do too. Well, I do it. <laughs> Honestly, there's been some studies out now that are starting to show that there's, and I'm, I'm going to get crucified for saying this, but it's the studies that I've read are showing that there's actually less damage with a barbed fly than there is with a barbless fly over an extended period of a fight because the barbed fly has room to wiggle. It moves around and it can tear a lot more. Whereas the barbed, I'm sorry, the barbless fly moves moves more in the fish's mouth and can tear more. Whereas the barbed fly has a tendency to stay put in the fish's mouth and doesn't tear up as much stuff. Like I said, those are studies. I don't know how what the necessarily how much merit they are. But I will say this. I pinch barbs on stuff when I guide for my own sake mm-hmm. as a guide because especially pulling streamers, I don't want guys smacking me. I mean, you get hit multiple times. I have a joke in my boat. If you hook me, it's no big deal. I'm not – that's it's not a big deal. If you hook me and draw blood, that's a 30-pack of beer <laughs> or a fifth of whiskey, your choice. Yeah, fair enough. And I've had multiple clients come through, and I don't obviously expect yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, t- it's, it's a joke. It's a joke. Kind of. <laughs> but, exactly. But I've had multiple clients, like, st- stop at the store on the way back. I'm like, oh, you need something? I'm like, yeah. And they'll come out with a fifth of whiskey and put it in my – and I'm like, no, it was a joke, you know? <laughs> They're like, nope, nope. And, but – it is a safety deal with it those is, it's barbs, It's a safety though. deal with streamers especially, and it's the same thing with – I have two pair of glasses in my boat at all time. I have my regular sunglasses, um, and I run those I run those Smith guides with the igniter lens mm-hmm. so they can get real dark on the sunny days, oh, cool. and they can lighten way up. That's smart. But there's still days when those are too dark, mm-hmm. and so I've got a pair of – they're yellow – Lens, I run the yellows. Yellow I love them. Yeah. yeah. On those low light days or when it's evening, getting dark, I put the yellows on. Not only can I see better, but my eyes are protected. I will never fish without glasses. I never ha- – I haven't – you won't see me the last 15 years ever fishing without no. glasses. I don't care if it's getting dark. I'll still be wearing my no. glasses. And, and my joke in my boat is I don't want to become a cyclops. <laughs> you know, it's, yeah. like, it's like yeah. I, you just can't lose exactly. one of your eyes. But the, it is a safety deal with this. And, and definitely less experienced fishermen, they buzz the tower more. Experienced oh, yeah. fisher, fishermen, I like, like, like I haven't – I've never hooked anybody. I, I maybe hooked myself 15 years ago or 20 years ago. But, you know, it doesn't happen very often. I've got good control of my rod, my line, and the wind. It's not that big a deal. But it's I buzzed the tower a couple times yesterday. Like it's throwing streamers and it's hooked it on the bottom or yep, something. And happens. all of a sudden it comes loose. And it all of a sudden my fly flew in between me and my rower. That You know, we call that throwing one through the cage yeah. and it's like you got to stay clear of that but it could happen at the drop of a oh, yeah. hat you could oh yeah and we all it. do it you yep. know i mean sam buried us buried in a, a big articulated streamer in my back this summer <laughs> <laughs> and i'm like well part of it is and i tease him about this is he has a he's a saltwater guy he spends so much time fishing the salt sam has a tendency to s- kind of underhand sling his casts Especially when he's double hauling, he almost goes like sidearm and like 
does this motion where his cats almost come from underneath. Yes. And he gets – and it's a – so he doesn't stay over his head all the time. And he knows, and I'm like, dude, you're underhanding it, you know. Hey, Lamar Jackson, knock it off. You know what I mean? But it's like he buried one in my right – I mean, <laughs> if it would have been an arrow, I'd have been a spine shot bull elk laying there flopping around on the bottom of the boat. I mean, he hit me hard. Oh, those and, things hurt, dude. dude. Don't they? I mean, oh. it, it wasn't like a light one. This thing had big barbell eyes on it, and it buried it. But there again, we pinched the barbs, and it I think it fell out, to be real honest. But I had a nice bloody spot on the back of my shirt for the rest of the day. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you're buying dinner. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, and, and it, you know, that kind of stuff happens, and it's like, it okay, whatever. Yeah, but no big deal. wearing glasses, like you said, whether they're sunglasses or whether those, I, I call them shooting glasses. You look like, I look like Walter Sobchak out there on the river, you know, with those big yellow aviators on. But they work, and they, they improve your vision, and they protect your vision, and that's huge. But so that pinching barbs isn't, for me, it helps the fish but it's more for my own sake than mm-hmm. anything else. Mm-hmm. And getting back to losing those fish, one thing that I've noticed is pinching barbs all these years is you have to stay hard on those fish. Tight on them. Man, you got to be more than tight. You got to be like that rod's got to be doubled up all the time. Yep. And you, it's, you're on the verge of horsing those fish in because then they start shaking their head. If that fly can move, it's gone. It falls out. And – that doesn't happen with bar with flies with barbs on them. They stick and they and they hold in there. But yeah, I know for a fact that I've lost some really big fish over the years because I was using barbless flies, especially mm-hmm. streamers. But it seems like when you got them, you got them. Yeah, you, you know, it's yeah, like when uh, they're stuck really good. We fish. The other thing is, and I think I told you this: what I do with articulated streamers, is I cut the front hook off oh. on articulated streamers. So the only hook on my fly is that back hook. Oh wow! And my my catch rate. When I started doing that, my catch rate went through the roof. Really? And I learned and I learned that musky fishing. Because those muskies in particular with those big, powerful jaws and those great big teeth can bite into even like a wooden bait. I, that's why I wouldn't use wooden baits anymore because they could bite into that wooden bait and you couldn't move it in their mouth hmm. to get a hook set. And I had more than one muskie get right to the boat, open their mouth, shake their head, open their mouth, and the plug comes flying out. They never had a hook in them. Because they could clamp on that thing so hard that you couldn't move that bait in their mouth. So I started fishing all, like, all my body baits were hard, hard plastic. So it would slide through their mouth. Hmm. And those hooks would catch. And you'd have them hooked in the side of the head, you know, where that hook finally caught. But you got them. And I, st- I kept losing fish after fish after fish. You know, they crush it and articulate it like a, like a dungeon or something. They just light it up. And I freaking strip set even. And couple big head shakes, and boom, they come off. I'm like, what is going on? I, that fish, I know I had that fish. And I just went, I thought back to that, and I thought, you know what, I'm going to cut that front hook off and just see. And lo and behold, it was a, it was fishing a barely legal, um, and it was early in the year, probably late February, early March, and it was fish that had dropped back off the reds, those big males, but they were still really territorial, really hungry. They were crushing that streamer, but we were, I was 50, 50 to land to hook ratio. And I cut that front hook off and it went up to damn near hundred percent. God, I got to try that. Yeah. It's just that start, that fly has a, t- it has a chance to slide through and that bottom hook just buries and usually in the corner pocket in that jaw and you don't lose them. Sets that bottom hook better. Yep, it does. Huh. It does. It's interesting. I always think that front hook, it's usually the bigger size hook. Yep. So I, I keep it on there for that so yep. I get a good grip in them. But I hadn't thought of that, Todd. I got to try that. Yep. Oh, that's wild. But I mean, yet- you think about some of those big deer hair patterns, like a dungeon, for instance. That head's big and bulky. And a big, powerful brown, in theory, and I think it's true, I think it can grab that tight enough where you have a hard time moving it. Especially if you're fighting the current. You know, and you, you may not you may not get the greatest hook set sometimes. And I just don't think we get hooks into those some of those fish that mm-hmm. we lose. I really don't. And it's that's changed everything. Well, it's interesting. I like your theory of that bottom hook gives more space for that fly to move and, and bury that hook into the side of their mouth, you yep. know, or 
top of their mouth or wherever it buries in there. But it's yeah, just something that's I've noticed. It's yeah. just something I've noticed over yeah. years and years of the fi- of fishing and guiding that that's if I'm and I don't always do it. There's certain patterns I do, mm-hmm. like barely legals. They all have all mine barely legals. So that front hook gets cut off, gets cut off. And if I'm tying them, I don't, I don't, I'll cut it off and tie it on just the shank. The fly's got a great swim to it, oh doesn't it? Oh my gosh! That olive and white, that, that would kill it on that river I fished yesterday. Yeah. That, oh, they like that olive and white. But actually, I was getting them on the white yesterday. It was yeah. good. But yeah, um, that's interesting. But it does seem like barbless hooks. Like, we have to fish single barbless hooks out on the Olympic Peninsula for those giant steelhead. But when you get them, you got them. Yeah. You know, and same thing with, with my streamers, all the barbs pinch. But when I got them, I got them. He yeah. isn't coming off there. Like well, I, Part of that is you know how to fish them. Yep. You know, and, and you know, like what we said, it's amazing to me. I have a lot of different skill levels and abilities go through standing in front of my boat every year, every summer. And... It's really amazing. There's guys that get it. Like, you got to put pressure on that fish. And there's other guys that, man, they're babying them. And it's human nature or like fisherman's nature that when they hook something big, they don't want it to get away. Mm-hmm. So they back off on the pressure. Mm-hmm. They're like, ooh, ooh, ooh. It's the worst move babying. you can That's make. the worst thing you can do. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like now's the time to go, to go pedal to the metal. Yeah, get now's after that Now's the time thing. to get after that fish. Yeah. Because if you're not in control of him, he's got all the power and he's going to kick your butt. And that's when I see guys lose big fish is when they get tentative. Mm -hmm. When they get timid and tentative, it's over. Mm -hmm. It's over. They almost always lose the fish. I'd much rather see somebody, well, that young girl that I was telling you about, the, the boyfriend and girlfriend, she, there was nothing timid or tentative about her. When she set the hook on a fish, he knew it. He was in trouble. Good hook sets catch uh, man, fish. People man. don't set that hook hard enough. No. And and you talked about snapping fish on your hook set. That'll happen sometimes. Right. Like you gotta right. give it to them. Well, when you, you gotta know what you're doing, what yeah, you're yeah. fishing to. I mean, you're not. I'm not gonna set the hook on a size 18 betas dry fly parachute. You know, no, parachute, that's a touch different. That stuff's different. But you still gotta you gotta stay tight to them. Everything's different, you know, and it's all those little intricacies of knowing okay i can put a ton of pressure on this fish because i've got this tippet and this hook and yada yada but now i've backed it off and sometimes in the same day i've backed it off because they're eating i've stumbled into a blue into a betas hatch and i'm fishing a size 18 parachute blue wing olive i could just i just have to lift the rod you know about fishing i've gone from zero x to four x and I just lift the rod and kind of hang on mm-hmm. and let the rod do the work. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, you're going to lose it. You're yep. going to pull them out. Uh, it's, and that's experience. Yeah. That's watching other people. Messing up a ton. Oh, man. <laughs> that's like all of us. Oh, man. But, and yesterday, you know, it was so wild. Like, um, that streamer bite can be really finicky. And they were eating it yesterday. And uh, we finally ha- found the setup. My little white was working really good. So, Dylan had me in the front. We're catching them out of the boat, and we're tossing them towards the bank. And they're slower retrieves, um, but they're like a strip pop, strip pop, you know, that little that movement to it, right? But as we're doing it and getting into those deep holes, I'm almost tugging on that line really slow and then a pop. Mm-hmm. Grab the line really slow, then a pop. But the subtlety or the difference of hooking those fish – was in the hook set of that thing. So you could throw it out there and say you could be coming in and you're strip pop, strip pop. And in the middle of your pop, you're stripping and you feel a little something on the line there. You're not even sure if it's a fish, if it's the bottom. You're not even sure if it's anything. But the very next pop, you set and give it to them, you know, and then it's fish on. But if you didn't feel it in the in-between of that strip or feel it in your hands and you gave it a normal pop, you'd get a bump and the fish would be gone and you'd watch him roll and he ate the streamer and you didn't get him on the hook set. That that hook set was so important yesterday and it was almost in between the pops when you were pulling the line in and it was feeling feeling like with your stripping hand, your left hand that was on the line, feeling any resistance, anything in it. And if you felt anything, then you had to set the very next one. And then I, it was lights out. I was catching every fish that came after me. So those fish were doing what, what walleyes do when you're jigging walleyes. They'll eat it on the fall. Yes, that's what they were doing. They were eating it on the fall. And to be able to feel that with a fly rod, 
is incredibly hard. Yes. Because the fly, lo- fly rod and fly lines, and were you fishing a sink tip? Yep. Yeah, so everything is against feeling things. Everything's going to be ev- – the more weight you put into your setup, the more dead feeling it becomes, right? And you're feeling for that line to stop or mm-hmm. that fish to really pound it. Well, in the wintertime like this, those fit bites are subtle. They're so subtle They're on a streamer. Subtle. You could hardly yep. feel them. Yep, and so your little strip pop, you're fishing it like, a swim, like you're swimming a jig. Because mm-hmm. that streamer's doing this through the water. Instead mm-hmm. of darting ahead, it's – rising up and down in the yes, water column and exactly. it's ho- hopping along and those fish were eating it on the fall mm-hmm. if you'd have been fishing a spinning rod and a jig you'd have felt the exact same thing but because you had monofilament line or braided line and a stiff shorter rod you'd have felt you'd have felt that tap from that fish inhaling that jig but on a streamer rod and a flyer, you're not going to feel that very mm-hmm. often. And, and every once in a while, you'd feel a pop or you'd grab it a little bit right, better. Right. But sometimes it was so subtle, subtle. in there. Subtle. And then you just had to knew uh, you had to know when you felt that resistance or anything yeah. weird. The very next one, you set the hook and it'd be fish yep. on. Yep. And that's and it's man, I think back to to all the fishing, whether it's fly fishing or fishing with tackle or whatever, whether it's they're eating stuff on the fall, uh, muskies and pike will eat stuff on the paws. You're you're ripping a you're ripping a bait. You're fishing a lot like stripping a streamer. Same motion. You're ripping a big uh, jerk bait or a big crank bait, and it'll zip ahead and then stop. And if it's a floater, it'll start to rise in the water column, and that's when those fish. A lot of times they'll eat it, and you won't feel it until you go to rip it again, and there's a fish there, mm-hmm. and you rip right into a big hook set, mm-hmm. and it's. And I mean, that's what you were doing yesterday. It's so fun. Yeah. I love coming tight and setting, yeah. thinking, okay, I think that was a fish. The next one, pop, and then he's there, and you go tight on him, and then you just feel wag, wag. And you yeah. you got a really good hook set in him that way, too. Yep. You know, you yep. buried those hooks into him. Yep. But, yeah, it was fun. And, and also – that fly having good action in the water, like so many streamers can look good in the vice, but they got to look good in the water and, and messing around with those patterns to really find one with a tail that has that wiggle to it. I think, yeah, the kick in the swim. I think that was so important yesterday. Like the the flies that I see the best swim and the best kick. and, And that's why they were reacting to that pop. So, so well, you know, that every time you'd pop it, you'd swim it and move quick, you know, and then settle down you know and they 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 just wanted it you know it's so fun no good for you yeah and that river you were fishing yesterday this time of year doesn't see a ton of pressure no there's nobody no there's hardly anybody out there winter time it picks up pretty big in spring does it and then it gets real big in the summer um that thing gets i mean big double in size or triple in size quadruple in size wow everything that you're seeing that's exposed right now basically basically that water goes up to the vegetation line wow so everything that was out of the water and like you had big rock bars up to the bank where their grass would be it's the water's literally lapping at the trees and stuff in there oh it's got to be fun to fish it at that water it can be because that river's so twisty and turny and it's got a lot of fall to it that there's always soft spots there's always seams and inside spots that when the water's really high you can still catch fish I've had some of my best days down there fishing one spot and never moving. Usually indicators because the water is usually pretty murky by that time and the streamer goes through there too fast usually and you need to indicator fish it. And they're usually on bugs pretty hard when it's like that. And you'll go, you'll catch five, six fish and the bite will go dead. And you'll go sit on the bank for a minute or whatever and, or change flies come back five six more and you can stand in the same spot for two hours and catch fish the whole time because there's that many fish piled in there every fish in the river has to be in these certain spots Hmm. so it can be a lot of fun that can be a lot of fun that that river's when i when i first when i first started fishing it i was like i gotta learn this thing because it's right here it's right in my backyard Mm -hmm. it's like i gotta learn this river and 
It's it fish is good. It's fun. It, there's a bunch of good. You, uh, we are both so fortunate where Big we time. live. The West and these ecosystems that grow this aquatic like aquatic life and these bugs. I mean, you can go out to rivers all across America, even Pacific Northwest, where I catch those steelhead. You go try, try to catch a trout in those rivers later on. They just don't have it. These rivers of the West, they're just made for fly fishing. The populations, the yep. bug life, the fish life, and then and then also. You know, the, the, the fish are able to get big. There's a lot of streams that you'll never catch a fish bigger than 12, 15 inches. You That's know? the thing that a lot of my clients, when I'm fishing, I, I've gotten to the point where I guide one river. That's just, that's what I do. I used to guide all kinds of different stuff, and I've just gotten to the point where in it, get my guiding, I'm not that young, hungry guy anymore that's like, this is how I'm making my living. I guide now because I enjoy it, because I like taking people out. But I'm not the guy that's going to run 150 trips a year. That's not me. Not anymore. Well, you got a full-time editing job. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) I might get a little upset, you know. Well, what do you mean the magazine's not ready? Well, I guided the last five days, you know. Fishing was hot. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Not going to happen. And got a family to support, you know, and – and this, that, and the other. Well, thing, like but. we talked about, there isn't enough time on, on mm-hmm. in this world to do no. everything you love to do. You just run out of time. No, not hardly. But, but go ahead. Sorry. No, no. You're so getting back to what you were saying about catching those guys are guys, you don't know what you don't know. And I remember it happens every summer. Guys book a trout fishing trip, right? And they're thinking in their mind, in their where they fish trout or where they've fished trout in the past, you know. 10 to 15 inch fish a 14 or 15 inch trout that's a nice fish and it is it -hmm. is absolutely but and then they so their eyes go up when they start rigging them up and they're i'm showing them what they're you know it's like what are we fishing snook i mean are you kidding me and then they hook into some of the like the fish that that these western rivers hold and their jaw drops and they're like i can't believe that's unbelievable i just caught the six biggest fish of my life in the last 30 minutes, you know, I don't, I don't think I've had a single client in the last couple of years that hasn't caught their biggest trout of their life. And usually they, they, they'll catch one and then an hour later they'll best it. <laughs> I mean, but that's what we can do on these yeah, Western rivers. You can. And, I, and I'm talking about, these are guys that are coming from the Southeast or coming mm-hmm. from the Midwest or I remember growing up, I'd have a goal where I want to catch a 20, a, a 20 inch brown every year. First off, when I was a kid, it was like, I want to catch a 20 inch brown. Mm-hmm. And then it was, well, I want to catch a 20 inch brown every year. And it's like we said earlier, it's like, if I don't catch a 20 inch fish or brown, like every time I go now, it wasn't a good <laughs> it's day. It's slow, yeah. <laughs> it's like, that sucked. That's what do you so mean true. that sucked? I caught 30 fish and never got a 20. <laughs> <laughs> we're so fortunate, we're, aren't we? We're spoiled. Yeah, man. and there's yeah. just still great fishing to be had. There's still great exploring, you know, different systems I've never fished. And got that uh, a couple weeks ago, I caught a tiger trout. You ever caught one of those? I saw that. I saw that. I've never caught one. Um, we're we're right here. We're you know, as you know, we're surrounded by mountain ranges like you are, and all these alpine lakes that are in these mountain ranges they stock them with all kinds of crazy stuff there's goldens in these lakes they put them full of splake they put lakers in there and one of them well not one but several have tigers in them Mm -hmm. and dan picard went up he didn't know he went up to fish this little lake he he had heard had grayling in it well he got fish in the creek in between these two lakes it was full of tiger trout wow yeah none of them were real big this is high high mountain stuff he caught a couple that were like 14, 15. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, he caught like 30 tiger trout in one afternoon. Mm. It was nuts. Yeah, I caught that one on that system out here. No kidding. Yeah. Um, yeah it was a good fish, too. That was a big fish. <laughs> it was a nice fish. Yeah, that was a big fish. Yeah, uh, crazy. I, you just was, never know. It's wild to go out on a system, uh, catch a fish that I've never caught before. But there's so much exploring to be done. Right. And even – I, I mean, I could be right around my home range or within an hour of my house and still fish new systems. And, and there's also – there's rivers that that, that um, are guided, that there's guides that know really well, that there's fishermen that know really well. 
but there's also rivers and systems that are made perfect for like those fly crafts or single man boats yeah. that nobody's fishing on that are great brown trout fisheries that'll just crush a streamer and it's got the tri- type of habitat to grow those next level trout too with those yep. 24 inch plus there's just um we're really lucky living out west and chasing trophy trout because there's nothing that gets more fun. And, and not only chasing the trophy trout, but chasing those action days, too, where right. you're just right. laughing the whole day and catching them. Uh, we're so fortunate. Yeah, man. It, you can do it on so many systems. So many. Like you said. I I think about growing up in Michigan, and we were blessed to have tremendous trout fishing there. But it pales in comparison to Montana or Wyoming or I mean, take your pick. Just about any west, any of these western states. Yeah, I can drive. We were laughing earlier. We're three hours apart, roughly. Mm-hmm. And I've got to cross a dozen top tier, <laughs> next level trout streams <laughs> I know. to get to you to go fish the Madison. Yeah, I have to drive for an hour and a half along the Yellowstone, and I'm like, oh yeah, whatever. It's the Yellowstone. <laughs> there's oh. people who spend their whole lives saving money to go come out or not oh, saving the, money but they dream about fishing the stone and the and yellowstone's a great system it'll grow phenomenal. giant trout yeah oh, i don't you, think i don't think there's any system out west that grows bigger fish mm-hmm. i think that i think there's fish in there that die of old age that are dinosaurs man that are i mean it would not surprise me if somebody pulled a 20 pound brown out of the out of the yellowstone mm-hmm. and that you look at those holes and those banks and where those the, all the habitat that those fish have and limitless I, it's just there's got to be there's giants in there we should meet that's a good halfway point you know for guy, us too. guy loves to fish the yellowstone he spends quite a bit of time on it later later in the summer it fishes good late summer yes it does and that's the thing is you could pick a pretty small float i don't there really aren't any small floats on the yellowstone but you could do one i keep threatening to do like a multi-day float where i put in like way up high not not in paradise valley but you know by or somewhere around i-90 mm-hmm. and floating down to like columbus mm-hmm. and taking a keeping a tent and camping on some of those islands and stuff i my buddies and i've talked about doing that for years and i think that'd be a blast oh it's so fun I think just got to go do it, yeah, don't just we? Two, three day float. You know? Oh, you'd see so much water, and it'd be fun to stay on the on the river like that yes, and do a two, three day expedition. Yep. Yep. Yeah, it wouldn't take too many logistics, or it'd be no, easy. No, no, you do. throw. I mean, a couple of dudes, and you throw in, you know, with good grief, with our backpacking tents and stuff. Everything's so small. Oh, yeah, you pack it in a in a box and throw it behind the seat, and you got everything you need. Your cooler's full of food and. Good grief, you could live like a king compared, oh, to, you could. compared That's to what, what was, we do in the, in, the, in, the, in the hunting. Good grief. That's all I was thinking about as you were talking. I was like, oh, man, I could live off steaks. I could yeah. have a cold beer at night. I could. <laughs> and then September rolls around and you're back to living uh, like, a, like a dirt bag yeah, in the hills, you know. Yeah, that's it. Eating freeze-dried meals and. Yeah, I hear you. No, we should do that. that let's would be, do it. That'd be a let's good plan time. on it. Yeah, I know Sam wants to do that too. Oh, that let's do it. All three could, of us. We could go do. Yeah, we could easy go to do. run the shuttle. Halfway yep. meeting point. Giant fish. Yep. Perfect recipe for me. You know, and if we got four dudes, Take that would be boats. even better. Take yeah. two boats because then you got more. Because you get three guys, and Sam's a big dude. Mm-hmm. Sam's six two, and built like me, mm-hmm. and. <laughs> You get me and him in the same boat. There's not a lot of room for a lot of other stuff, you know. <laughs> but if you did, if we did two boats with two guys in each boat, you'd have a lot of room for camping gear and luxuries. Oh, you know? it'd be so fun. It'd be a riot. Yeah. And you just use Onyx to figure out where your public spots are that you could camp. Piece of cake. Easy. We have to do it. Yeah, I let's do it fun. late summer. It uh, the Yellowstone doesn't come into shape till late summer. No, you're it's wasting like a, your time. Yeah, yeah, it's it is an August fishery. Or my July, wife, August. My wife and I's anniversary is um, no good grief, can't remember now. <laughs> oh, you'd be in so so July much trouble. July tw- anyway, it's late July, July twenty fourth. I think I'm pretty sure. And I'm horrible. They say men are horrible with it. dates. I never miss oh, it. Oh, good for you. But to know it off the top of my head. Mm-hmm. I'm like, uh, is that the right day? Mm-hmm. But anyway, yeah, I think it's the 24th of July. And we, I, I'm, where I'm going with that is we took a fishing honeymoon. And we borrowed Sam's boat. I didn't have a boat at the time. And we just traveled around. 
in the West. She'd only been in, in Wyoming for a couple of years. And so there was a bunch of stuff I wanted to show her and a bunch of stuff I wanted to experience for the first time as a couple. Well, for fishing wise, it was, we couldn't have picked a worse time to try to fish and mm-hmm. be successful because it was like, it can we, be a tough time of year. It was that late July is an in-between time. Yeah. It can be a like, lull. Man, it can be really bad. And, and it's one of those deals where what we ran into was the really big rivers that move a lot of water, like the Snake and the Yellowstone, they weren't fishing yet. They were still coming out of runoff, and they were they just weren't in shape. We caught some fish, but not we didn't tear them up. And rivers like the Madison were out. Mm -hmm. They were done. Everything was over, and the hoppers weren't turned on yet. Mm -hmm. So it was tough fishing. And luckily, we that wasn't the point of the trip. It was a honeymoon. We were just sightseeing and having a good time, and and we we did some exploring and some different things and had a really good time. But that was when I learned there's that no man's land window in the summertime Mm -hmm. where you're further ahead. And honestly, usually that time of year, the mountain lakes, the mountain streams are in shape and they're on fire and it's back to fishing your early spring stuff like you know early caddis and pmds and stuff sallies good grief you get some of these mountain streams on and start fishing yellow sallies for those cutties <laughs> you know have a hundred fish day you know it's awesome so fun and that's that's fun too you know you get up there you're not catching those giant fish but there again we're spoiled we mm-hmm. are blessed out here because there's so much good fishing. There's so much to do. We can't even get to it in a lifetime. No. You know, I haven't no. even got to the stuff in Montana or the stuff even all around me. You know, yeah. I just need to continue to explore. Um, you know, in the in the Madison, it's so good and so fun and right in my back door that it's hard not to go there. But uh, there's just so much cool stuff to see. And I, we're explorers by nature. It's always fun to get on a new river and try to figure it out. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. I think back on some of the, my some of my favorite fishing trips. And they're all, they were all to new water. And sometimes you got your butt kicked. Oh, yeah. In fact, more often than not, you got your butt kicked. But, man, if you figured it out and you caught, like, a couple of fish or you, maybe you really got into them, there's nothing better. There was nothing better. I remember huh, we were on this fly-in. Actually, it wasn't a fly-in. It was a boat-in trip in Ontario. And we were fishing uh, walleyes. There was, of course, there's pike everywhere, and I I brought a fly rod to fish for pike, and but it was summer, so the big pike were deep, and they're hard to get to, and the walleye fishing was okay. There was a there's a big mayfly hatch in that part of the country called the Hexagenia. It's the equivalent of our salmon fly hatch out here. Just the amount of bug life that comes off. I mean, it shows up every year on on weather radar, on Doppler radar. These big clouds of bugs do. And it's insane. But when that happens, those fish, almost all the fish in the system, but especially the walleyes, they shut off because they're feeding on those bugs. And you can, they're really, they get really hard to catch. Well, we hit right in the middle of that thing. So it was like the pike fishing was good, but they were little. Well, there was this rumor of this lake that had big pike, like giants. And it's shallow, and they, they went up in there anyway. And it was like no joke to get to. This thing's like, I think it was eight miles or nine miles off of the system we were on. And it was this little tiny beaver dam choked creek that you had to navigate to get back in there. And, you know, we're with our dads, a bunch of older guys, and nobody's going to do it, you know. And I was like, man, we need to do that. That'd be fun. And I got one adventurous buddy that's like, yeah, let's go. So we loaded up a canoe. It's the only way you could get in there. We put an outboard motor in the canoe, all our fishing stuff, couple rods, packed a cooler full of stuff, and we took off. And I think we dragged that canoe further than we actually floated it, but it's nasty. You're so, we're soaking wet. We, I mean, we're wearing pants and stuff, but you, you're soaking wet in and out of the boat, and you could forget about staying dry. And it's summertime, so it's hot. Mosquitoes are just clouds, those northern clouds of mosquitoes. We got back into that lake, and it's like this Shangri-La, man. You come around this corner, and it's the outlet where this little creek dumps in. 
And we were going, oh my gosh, look at this. We fished for six hours on that lake and never saw a pike. <laughs> 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 and we were bug bitten and we were hungry and we were dehydrated and we were, oh, it was brutal. And we fished everything. We never moved a fish. And it's still, when we talk about that trip, that's what he and I talk about because that was the coolest part. You know, did the same thing on Kodiak Island in when I was up there commercial fishing. There was, we had a window of time where we didn't have anything going on. It was over the holiday, the 4th of July holiday weekend. And there's these lakes, these mountain lakes that little, they empty out into the ocean on this, on a different part of the island, on, a, on another part of the island. Same island, but different part, way far away. And I hatched this plan. I'm like, well, why don't, why don't we take the canoe and carry it through that mountain pass it was like Lord of the Rings stuff, you know? <laughs> and carry that canoe over that mountain, through that mountain pass, and those lakes are right down on the other side. It can't be more than three miles through there. And I was like 22 years old, you know, and my buddy's going, you're crazy. You're nuts. I'm like, yeah, but think about it. We know that the fishing in those lakes and the river that goes, that flows out of them to the other end of the island is phenomenal, and nobody fishes it, man. We'd be the only ones in the world who've ever done that. I was like, all right. And I talked him into it. I said, I tell you what, you carry the stuff, I'll carry the canoe. That was because he didn't want to carry the canoe. So we made it, we made plans where somebody would pick us up at the other end where the river dumps out. This is I mean, this is like forty miles down down on the other side of the island. We're gonna do this, right? So we carry this canoe. I carry this canoe. He's got the pack up, bear trails. Everything's bear trails on Kodiak. If there weren't bears on that island, you wouldn't be able to walk through half the, half anywhere because there's be no, you can't navigate through that stuff. It's so thick. But the bears have trails, and I was able to navigate that canoe up that through that mountain pass and down the backside. Of course, you're standing on top of the pass and look down at these two little lakes that are way down there. He's like, you're crazy. I'm like, well, it's easy now. I can slide that thing down from here, you know. <laughs> Well, luckily, I carried it down about three-quarters of the way and hit a stream. And I just dumped it in the stream and floated it down to the, to the lake. Well, then we hit white caps on this lake, blown right in our face. It took us like four hours to navigate this little tiny lake. Got to the other end, and there are freaking bears everywhere. I mean, big brown Volkswagen buses with claws and teeth eating salmon at the mouth of this river, right? But in with all those salmon and bears are more rainbows and Dolly Vardens than you can possibly imagine. And, of course, the bears, it's Kodiak, they get hunted, so they're, they're pretty, especially the big bears, are pretty skittish of you. And they see us and they take off. So we got the whole place to ourselves. And we start fishing. And, Brian, I'm not kidding you. At that time in my life, I'd never seen anything fishing like that. It was every single cast you had on a trophy rainbow trout. And those big Alaskan leopard rainbows, you know, it was, dude. And if it wasn't a rainbow, it was a great big Dolly Varden. And it was, like, unbelievable. And you got this mass of sockeye salmon. They're all balled up the mouth of this river trying to do their thing, you know. And, well, it, we're fishing right up until dark. And he looks at me, he whistles at me. He's like, hey, what, what are we going to do for sleeping? I went. I was going to sleep right here, like make a lean-to out of the canoe in a tarp and just sleep here with all these bears. I'm not sure that's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> so we ended up, there was a cabin. It was a bear hunter's cabin further back up the lake. And we ended paddling back up to that in the dark, got to it. And it's, you can't lock a bush cabin in Alaska. You got to leave it open. You don't necessarily have to leave. Most people leave supplies and stuff, but you can't lock a structure. It's got to be accessible. And it was open. You know, they got it all latched up and stuff, but we didn't have to break in. You just use it. Mm -hmm. We walked in there. And it's a private lease, an outfitter's cabin. And we didn't mess with anything. There's food and there's, we could have fired up the stove and everything, but we didn't. So it's like, we're going to sleep one night. That was the coldest night I've ever spent anywhere in my life. It was got down into the 30s that night and we were all sweaty from being our waiters and stuff all day and working up over that pass dude 
I I don't think I slept for more than thirty minutes at a crack that night. It just froze the whole time. God, you get a chill on you like that, yeah. and then thirty degrees. It and was damp? bad. Oh and, man, and that's Kodiak, cold. So it's damp, as yeah. you as you know. Coastal. Oh, that coastal cold. I and mean, man, it was brutal. And I sun started cracking that horizon at like five o'clock that morning, and we were up because we were freezing. Got us some food, took off, and we said, so then now we got to float this river. Which are like, you can do it in a day. And I'm thinking, yeah, but what about fishing? So we'd already fished the upper end of the river extensively the night, the day before. So I was like, let's just float and fish the lower end. And if we see something really fishy in the middle, we'll, we'll hit it. But, well, the damn thing was, the water was so low that we couldn't float the canoe. We dragged that canoe through that river for miles oh my god i mean miles and there are bears everywhere you know there's it was nuts and we got down to the bottom end and there's the other lake we're like sweet because I, the outlet from the bottom lake is only like a half mile and you're in the ocean and we're like cool and that's where we're getting picked up so we had, we're fishing we got there midday late in the afternoon of course it stays light for so long that that far north worst fish it's same thing it was fish every cast it's streamers egg patterns nymphs we even caught some on dries i mean it was it was insane and then we paddled across the other lake and out and uh there's actually a group of cabins at the mouth of that creek and that was where we ended up staying there for the fourth of july party and man the sense of accomplishment that we had we got talking to some of the people that had been on the island for a long long time and there was one guy that had been there since the 50s 1950s and he was like you're the only people that have ever done that he's like nobody does that if people want to go in there they either hike in there or they fly in there in a in a in a biplane or in a float plane and they do what these was like to canoe that and do what you guys did nobody's ever done that i don't know if anybody's done it since <laughs> and it's like hell yeah that yeah. was awesome. And the, and the fishing just happened to be unbelievable. Favor fortunes the bold. Yeah, buddy. It was – and I have that, you know, that was – that was 20 years ago. It's amazing. Like, what an adventure, too. Like, to be able to take that canoe and float that with the brown bears and then the fishing and the whole deal. And, and I mean, the truth of it is, you know, you know, we get on the podcast – as humans, we tend to remember the best days fishing and, oh, I caught this big one. I, but there's a lot of days in between where you, you get your butt kicked or there's a lot of days where you explore. Like I know, you know, I've been exploring the Missouri a ton more or uh, uh, another smaller stream that's close to me. And, you know, it, some days it doesn't work out. Some days I spend the whole day scouting and, and fishing holes and I never touch a fish. I get yep. blanked. And I can get blanked on my home river of the Madison too. Oh, I've been, Sometimes, blanked. I've been blanked on the Madison yeah, they're, often. They're just off the bite. It can be a finicky right. river. Can't find what they're eating on. And so, but, but all of this is the experience in its entirety. Like it's, Absolutely. you go to see those good days and you go to see adventure and, in favor does fo fortune, you know, uh, fortune does favor the bolt, like uh, uh, going for it and all in and, oh, we're going to pull out at dark or like your deal, like hiking the canoe or some of that stuff we do on the coast. Uh, oh, there's a big log jam. Well, I'll figure it out. We'll portage. We'll do this or, you know, like uh, those are true adventures, whether you get them or not. And more times than not, when you do, when you put more into it or give a little bit extra or do a little bit, it pays off. Yeah. You end up seeing a big one or you yep. end up seeing some good fishing. But, man, that's what it's all about, well, man. Well, you got those stories to lay back yeah. to lay back on, you know, and tell your kids about. And I've got, fortunately, that was in the era of when digital cameras were first out. And I've got some some pretty darn good pictures. Oh, I'd from love that to time, see them. You know, yeah, that's amazing. So I can, t I'm going to be able to show that to my kids later on. And it's just, it's the best. It really is. That's being alive, man. It really is. Absolutely. That Absolutely. is being alive. Well, and, and you don't know what kind of impact you're going to have on the lives of other people too, mm -hmm. because the guy that was with me on that trip, we got done and he was like, I'm never doing that again. And I was like, <laughs> I'd turn around and go back right back <laughs> in there. You know what I mean? I was, I loved it loved it and he's like nope nope not doing that again and 
two people can have the same experience but come out of it very different. Mm-hmm. And But you know what he did do was him and his brother took the adventures that I talked him, him into having in Alaska. They went back and they guided at, oh, man, I want to say, I don't remember the name of the lodge, but it was one of the big lodges on the peninsula. And they both guided there for like three or four years. And the guy that was with me, the older brother, that's where he met his wife. She was like the bookkeeper at the lodge. And he literally came home, I think it was his second year. I don't know, it doesn't matter. Came home, went back to Michigan, said, I'm moving to Idaho. His family was like, what what do you mean? Like, I met a girl in Alaska, I'm moving to Idaho. He met her. They, they, and they're, I mean, just his wife and they have a couple kids happily ever after kind of thing. He would have never gone to Alaska if I hadn't dragged his butt up there. He wouldn't have. And I don't know his brothers, his brother, um, would probably have, but I don't know. Mm -hmm. I mean, not only did he end up having some amazing adventures up there, he met his wife at a lodge, you know, he ended up going back to a different place, but it was, I, that, that seed got planted. Oh yeah. You just never know where that kind of stuff's going to lead. If you went to taking him on that trip, he would have led a totally different life, which is just wild. Like yeah. the, the decisions you make in life, like yep. they, uh, um, where you end up from all those decisions you make. And they do all shape us. And, um, you know, it shaped him and probably made him tougher and, uh, and gave him the love of that adventure in fly fishing. But man, well, it, and, he, it, and he lives in Northern Idaho now and he loves it there. Mm-hmm. And he's on the, he lives on the, he's on the clear water. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I love it out here. He would have probably would have not done that. He probably would have come, probably would have stayed in Michigan. And there's nothing wrong with Michigan. Don't get me wrong, but I don't live there anymore for a reason, (laughs) you know. And yeah, it's. And I don't care whether it's. So I go. You go back to Michigan. I found when I was in high school, I had a track coach who was a big fly fisherman. Yeah, Yeah, the big fly fisherman, right? But he was, and he was an adventurous guy, and he was a fishy dude. And he he and I, uh, we all hit it off. We had this shared love of trout and bird hunting. Loved it. And we didn't really hunt together all that much, but we used to fish together once in a while. And we had that, that hexagenia hatch, like I was telling you about, happens at night. And you're usually looking for it. You're hunting it like you hunt the salmon flies, but... It doesn't go off in entire systems normally because they need a specific type of habitat. And that habitat is usually found in the lower ends of those river systems, that more like estuary stuff where it's, it's siltier and sandier, muckier, that swampy kind of stuff. That's where those bugs live. And it's a phenomenal, it can be a phenomenal hatch. But there's also a ton of pressure that comes with it. And, and it's almost all done on foot few guys float but it's the most po- the most effective way is to pick a very small because it's at night is to pick a small piece of water and get to know that really really well and target one or two fish as you're out there in an evening and so the hunt is always for the new spot right well in high school i never forget this this is back before onyx i mean internet wasn't even hardly a thing but we got looking at the maps and we looked at this big swampy section of the river and we were like, it's got to have bugs. It's got to have bugs. Figured out how to get in there, found a public piece of public access and just went and adventured and explored it. And dude, I mean, it's, this is stuff like cattails, 12 feet tall. You know, you can't see where you're going once you get out in the, in the river channels. Most of it's deep, you know, and there's beaver runs everywhere. I mean, this is like, serious stuff we got in there and it got dark and brian it sounded like you were standing under power lines there were there were millions of bugs it was a blanket hatch and we had this monster thunderstorm that night came through and as soon as everything cleared up those bugs came out they hit the water and it was unbelievable how many fish that we put in the net and it was the experience of the storm the bugs the new place it was incredible Long story short, you show a few guys, you know, and the next thing you know, it people find it, you know, over the over time. But 
I've got family and friends that still live back there that still fish that spot every year. They still fish it. And it's that adventure led has led to 30 years, well, 20 years of 25 years of fishing fun. And it's just don't know. Man, that's what it's all about. It's absolutely what it's all about. The adventure, the whole deal, and soaking it all in and having a good time while you're out there, camaraderie between friends and family. Man, that's what it's all about. Heck yeah. Yeah. Heck yeah. Well, I Todd, appreciate it. Oh, dude. Totally, what are we running on, like two hours? <laughs> I, I know. I ran a little bit long. It was a good conversation. I know. So I, know. I, I let her run. But I really appreciate you. Uh, make sure to go check out Todd on Wingman. Um, he runs – you guys have a ton of great content on there, too. Your videos. Uh, you run the podcast now, which you do a great job at. Thanks. Um, so much great content there. Make sure to give him a follow on IG and, and uh, check out his content on Wingman. You're a heck of a fly fisherman, one of my favorite people to fish with. we got to uh, make some plans here for spring and summer. And, um, man, good big game season. Uh, you're the editor here at Eastman's Hunting Journal, Eastman's Bow Hunting Journal. Yep. Uh, so anybody submitting articles, uh, interested in articles, they can always get a hold Absolutely. of you there. Absolutely. Yep. You do such a great job at that, too. Oh, I, thanks, man. Uh, I appreciate I, that. I love giving people your email just because I know you're going to respond back, and you're going to help them tell their story. Um, so you do a great job at that, man. You're just a really good friend. I appreciate you. Yeah, I appreciate you too, man. And it's the feelings mutual and I'm looking forward to d doing some of those adventures like we just talked about. Yeah. Let's plan together. some new ones. Yeah. That that's Yellowstone right. trips got to happen. Yeah, for sure. That's yeah. It's happen. only an adventure if something goes wrong, you know that, Yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> we got to sink a boat or something, you know? <laughs> All right, buddy. We'll talk soon. Thanks, Brian. All right, guys, that's a wrap. Uh, such a fun conversation with Todd. Again, uh, I just I just hit record and just get talking about fly fishing and about trout. And uh, the guy's so passionate that um, conversation comes easy. So um, really fun one to put out there. Hope you guys enjoyed it. And um, yeah, uh, thanks to the support of Avid Max. And, and if you guys like or support this podcast, uh, uh, help me out by, by sharing this, leaving me uh, reviews on iTunes, um, it really goes a long ways with, um, help pushing this podcast, the algorithm of it and, um, you know, just trying to reach more people and, and, uh, make a successful podcast that'll be here to stay. So I uh, appreciate you guys listening in and, and downloading the podcast each and every week and, uh, also letting your friends know about it and, um, sharing it. So with that, man, I think that's about it. It's starting to get above freezing, so I may get some fishing this week, and um, definitely this weekend I saw it was in the 40s, so uh, should be fun to go chase them around. I've got, um, with this latest cold snap, I got all my gear organized, um, got some new flies. Um, I, I picked up some from, um, oh, uh, I pick up some about everywhere I go from every different fly shop and things, but um, yeah, I, I I've just got some some good patterns. I'm I'm ready to go fishing. Uh, like I say, I'm all organized. Just needed to get warm here and um, keep getting after them. So uh, thanks again for listening, guys. Appreciate you, and we'll check in with you next week.